HD Smartcast. You are listening to a Mint production brought to you by HD Smartcast. Hello, everyone. I am Shipra from Mint's personal finance team, and welcome to this edition of Why Not Mint Money. Today, I have with me Karan Bhagat, MD and CEO, IIFL Wealth and Asset Management. Bhagat will talk about how he invests his own money, what makes him moderate risk investor, and his idea of wealth. So let's get started. Hi, welcome to Why Not Mint Money, a personal finance podcast where we help you understand basic money concepts and share strategies for you to build your wealth. So let's get started on your money journey. So, Mr. Bhagat, what's your current asset mix like between equity, debt, gold, real estate, and alternate asset class? Thank you. So, I think from uh, from my own personal wealth uh, asset class mix perspective, I obviously don't like to include my core financial holding of uh, the business I am in, which is IFL Wealth. Outside of that, my financial assets today are around about uh, 30 to 40% in equity, uh, 40 to 45% on the fixed income side, and around about 10 to 15% in alternates. Uh, this, I, uh, this is what I believe is the ideal mix for me, even in the longer term. Uh, for me, the equity exposure is slightly lower, purely because I'm in a business uh where uh, the ups and downs are slightly related to the equity markets uh on real estate itself i'm not a big fan uh so the only real estate i own is the house i stay in and I, right now i have a very small allocation to gold of around about 1 to 2% yeah so the house that you stay in do you consider that an investment also or or not not really i don't consider that as a as an investment because it's not something which is available for sale and uh, effectively if i was to sell it ever it obviously affects the quality of our life we're staying in so effectively can't treat it as a financial asset uh, it is obviously an asset but yeah. it can't treat it as a financial asset all right and how has your portfolio performed over the past one year so in last year portfolio returns uh, have been obviously uh, exciting for most part of the year the equity portfolio has done extremely well it's grown anywhere between the 15 to 22% mark for me personally it's grown at around about 18 or percent fixed income is fairly moderate at around about 7 to 8 percent and alternates have done extremely well um, and they've been in, in the region of 20 to 25 percent so overall on a blended basis uh, the portfolio is in the region of 15 to 16 percent last year uh, but i but i should warn given the fact that i've been in this business for the last 20 years i think last year's bit of an exception and most years moves towards the 11 12 percent mark that's right Are you shifting between market segments in in your equity allocation? Shubhra, it's a very good question, and I'm a firm believer of uh, of asset allocation. So typically, I'm I'm very conscious about uh, price to earnings multiples and price to book. Uh, typically, on the on the equity side, whenever the price to earnings are beyond 2021 and the price to book is beyond 3.6, 3.7, I essentially try and come uh, down and reduce my equity allocation to not more than 30 to 35 percent. So effectively, post COVID, as the markets have been going ahead beyond fifteen and a half, sixteen thousand, all the way to eighteen, eighteen and a half, and now back to fifteen and a half, sixteen, I've had only a thirty to forty percent exposure to equities. Uh, fairly valued zone for me for equities would obviously be between somewhere between the fourteen and a half to sixteen, sixteen and a half zone. That's really when I'll increase another twenty, twenty five percent in equities, uh, which is more or less starting now. And if ever they were to go to the undervalued zone, which is uh, below the today below the fourteen and a half fifteen thousand, I would then increase my equity allocation beyond the fifty five sixty percent to maybe the eighty five ninety percent zone. So I, I really look at it in three three broad buckets. In the overvalued zone, I'm approximately at the thirty thirty five percent mark. At the fairly valued zone, I'm around the seventy percent mark. And uh, in the undervalued zone, I like to be at the hundred percent mark. the uh, the only challenge with some of these uh, uh, things is it's easier said than done uh, because the markets can stay in overvalued zones for a very long period of time for example in the last two years uh, they've remained in the overvalued zone and that at that point of time to have the patience uh, to stay out of the markets is becomes extremely extremely important that's right and what about debt sir are you also moving categories in debt so debt i think uh, you know for me honestly i think debt is i personally don't look at debt as a very long term investment uh but uh, having said that i think for investors who want to or for if i was to ever build a portfolio where uh, i want to have a small safety pot uh where effectively uh, i'm assured of receiving 6 and a half 7% post tax 
Uh, I would love to do uh, government of India bonds or GSEX or even SDLs, uh, which is state development loans now, as the interest rates have moved up to around about 7.3, 7.4% for a 10-year period. Uh, similar to the equity side, uh, I think bonds are now today fairly valued somewhere between the 7 to 7.75 zone on the 10-year GSEC. And obviously, if they go beyond the 7.75% for 10 years, they'll reach a zone where they are massively undervalued. And for any investor who wants to lock in his money for 10 years, uh, post 7.75, he should consider it strongly because effectively with by taking sovereign risk, he will end up earning close to around about 6.77% post-tax after taking the benefit of indexation. Uh, obviously, when rates go below 5.5, they're a little bit overvalued. And at that point of time, having exposure to long-term papers is not too advisable. But overall, uh, I think right now for fixed income, uh, if you want to invest for the long term, it's a great time to lock in rates. On the shorter end, which is the zero to three years, I would prefer to keep my money. I'm, right now, I have all my money in um, in liquid funds and short, really ultra short term funds because I don't want to take any interest rate risk on the shorter end uh, where uh, medium term funds may end up giving slightly negative returns in case interest rates keep moving up. Uh, outside of that, I like to do a little bit of structured credit on the debt side and I also like to do REITs. Uh, so a small exposure I have on the REIT side in debt portfolio. Uh, REITs are special because uh, apart from giving an yield of five, five and a half, five point seven five percent, they have two big benefits for me. Uh, one, uh, they they are not subject to any tax, so effectively I end up getting five and a half percent post tax. Second, I'm able to participate in in uh, in the commercial real estate market without really having the headache of getting into uh, the challenges of leasing and not leasing. And most importantly, uh, inflation also helps. And we get a natural 2 to 2.5% capital appreciation as we go along. So REITs tends to be a good uh, good debt product, essentially giving us close to 7, 7.5%, 8% on a post-tax basis. And lastly, a little bit of structured credit, uh, but uh, very small amounts because structured credit typically tends to be fairly illiquid. So on the debt side of the portfolio, uh, I would have a large allocation currently to liquid and ultra short term. A uh, small allocation to, very small allocation to the longer term, a good allocation to REITs, um, and a very small allocation to structured credit. Right. Uh, so, in the last one year, sir, can you tell us one strategy that has worked for your portfolio and one which has not worked for your portfolio? Well, for me, honestly, from a portfolio strategy perspective, uh, I like to look at asset allocation uh, uh, decisions uh, as the most important. I think if I was to look back at the last 30 odd months or maybe even the last 24 months, I think the one strategy which has not worked is uh, I reduced my equity allocation uh, as markets were moving up at around about 15 and a half, 16,000. And obviously post that markets continue to move up towards 18, 18 and a half thousand. Dollar. But uh, uh, what has worked in retrospect uh, is uh, my ability to be patient and not come into the markets at 18, 18 and a half thousand. And stay steadfast in my decision to come into the markets only when the markets are back to 15 and a half, 16. Uh, obviously, it's wishful thinking. And what could have worked is if I would, could have come in at 15 and a half, 16 and sold at 18. But that more often than not doesn't happen. And uh, therefore, I think uh, my strategy on equities for the last 12 months has worked and has also not worked uh, because it's allowed me to, uh, uh, to stay out of the markets for the last uh, 15 to 18 months in a big way. And yet, uh, give myself the opportunity to come back into it uh, now and over the next six months as uh, as things cool down. That's right. Uh, so, do you also invest in international funds? And why is that if you do? No, so I do invest a bit in international funds. I would have liked to invest more. So, my international uh, investment strategy, like for many others, is not fully mature yet. Uh, but I think uh, from, a me- from a measure of diversification, both in terms of the currency as well as in terms of the uh, broader markets. I think it's a good tool to invest in. And uh, now we have a lot of feeder funds uh, which allow us to get exposure to uh, all ETFs practically across the world. So going forward, uh, today I would have a smaller allocation, maybe 3 to 4% to international equities. But going forward over the next 12 months, I would like to take that up to around about 10% of my overall portfolio. All right. And so what percentage uh, allocation uh, is to your own schemes? And are you going to change this in the uh, in the future? Uh, to our own IFL AMC schemes, you know. Yes, sir. 
No, so I think I'm I'm an investor, more or less, in all our schemes. And uh, if I was to look at my own uh, equity allocation, I think outside of my own direct stocks, I think from a scheme exposure perspective, more than 90% would be in uh, in, our, in the schemes managed by us ourselves. Uh, obviously, needless to say, I think uh, that's not going to change dramatically because uh, that's that's really gives us a maximum alignment of interest. And uh, wherever possible, and wherever I want to invest in schemes and funds, I would uh, ideally prefer to do it uh, within our uh, own ecosystem. Right. Uh, have you increased cash allocation in the last uh, 12 to 18 months? So, uh, Shubha, as I said earlier, I think I've, I've, I've been kind of invested only 25% for the last 18 months. Right. So, in that sense, I increased cash around about 24 months back uh, when the markets were moving up from 15,500. So, in some senses, I've been sitting on cash for the last uh, uh, 18 odd months. Beyond that, I've not increased cash. I've only invested 35% in equities. And uh, over the next six to nine months is when uh, I would end up deploying more. All right. How many months of emergency fund do you provision for? So, it's a function of, it's a function of uh, uh, two or three things, obviously. It's a function of whether you're active on your, um, on your job from a salary and dividends perspective. And it's also a function of uh, uh, emergency event around uh, uh, accidents, death and insurance. So I think overall, uh, we need to at least provide for, uh, at the minimum, if, if, if your savings allow, uh, for a 12 to 18 month uh, uh, emergency fund. I think it's, it's the minimum which we all need. Um, obviously, we, need, we have different, uh, different uh, venues to access that. We have the Provident Fund, we have, uh, we have insurance, and also, we have uh, a little bit of ability uh, to draw out, overdraw out on our salary and dividends, if, if the case may be, or salary rather, not really dividends. So, in, in that sense, I think uh, uh, I think 12 to 18 months uh, is sufficient. Obviously, uh, uh, this assumes you do not have too many loans and so on and so forth. For me personally, uh, I like to keep around about, uh, uh, give or take around about three to four months of my uh, monthly salary just available in the bank account and uh, maybe around about uh, uh, 15 to 18 months of uh, expenditure available in a, uh, in, 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 in a form of a fixed deposit or a bank account, which is immediately callable in 24 hours. Right. Uh, so, you know, moving away from your investments and just to know a little bit, bit about what you, you know, feel about your money and your personal wealth. Uh, what does wealth mean to you? <laughs> so wealth, honestly, I'd, uh, I've thought about it a lot at different points in time. So I think uh, uh, it can it can mean three things, right? So I think uh, at at a point where you have very little wealth, I think uh, it becomes uh, it becomes a necessity. Uh, it's something which is required, uh, and and your hunger for it is extremely extremely high uh, because you need to kind of get across some basic uh, hygiene levels across life. Uh, beyond a point, uh, you know, money is obviously becomes more, uh, more, more about uh, comfort and luxury as opposed to a basic necessity. And uh, lastly, I think uh, when when you end up uh, having having too much, uh, or maybe more than what what defines uh, necessary comfort, uh, it can also end up becoming a bit of a a, a challenge uh, or a burden, depending on how you approach it. So money has to has to not mean much. It has to be always a facilitator. Uh, in case it's not a facilitator, and uh, you know, it kind of becomes uh, the end goal rather than an outcome. Uh, I think uh, you can end up making it a big responsibility rather than uh, kind of enjoying it as you go along. So I think I'm very conscious of that, and uh, coming from a fairly uh, a fairly humble background, 20 25 years back, I'm I'm quite sure that uh, it's something which at best, I want to keep in the second quadrant, uh, where I moved from uh, necessity to comfort, rather than uh, letting it become something which uh, becomes uh, one of uh, uh, of burden and responsibility. Right. Uh, so, how do you involve your spouse in, in your family finances? So, so I'm lucky and blessed to uh, to have my spouse Shilpa, who's fairly uh, fairly astute in um, in managing money. I think she's she's she herself. Uh, uh, done an MBA and she's quite interested. So in that sense, I keep her fairly involved, uh, both in terms of uh, the finances and the broader decisions. Uh, she helps me out in the portfolio. 
but most importantly she's also involved in um, in kind of helping us think through our uh, succession discussions um in building out an asset register in terms of ensuring the nominations the second holdings are all in place and uh, you know if you were to think through trust structures and wills uh, she's fairly involved in ensuring those things are uh, uh, up to date so overall i think uh, you know both of us uh, give it give it uh, maybe one hour in a month or one hour in uh, two months and ensure that uh, most of the things are in place right that's quite wonderful so were you able to go on a holiday in the last uh, one or two years you know since the covid has uh, absolutely started. absolutely i'm very i'm very religious about my holidays <laughs> so uh, i love to travel uh, so i think the only uh, there's a good and a bad thing about holidays over the last two years i think uh, it's largely been restricted to dubai and maldives uh, so i've have uh, had the fortune of uh, going to maldives two or three times over the last two years and similarly i've traveled to dubai two or three times and uh, you know over the last uh, couple of months i've also been able to get out to europe once i think i'm looking forward to this summer uh, to be able to go out uh, more more towards europe and uh, at least have a longish holiday there all right any lifestyle changes during covid that you know that would become permanent i wish i can make it permanent but i think we ended up spending a lot of time with the kids at home uh, so that was a good lifestyle uh, good lifestyle change and uh, secondly i think uh, just just for me personally uh, uh, you know going for that walk in the building uh these two things i won't say they become permanent but uh, they definitely lifestyle changes through covid and uh, if i can make them permanent i think it would really uh, help me uh, enjoy life more all right so coming to the last question of uh, you know today's episode uh, what do you teach your children about money <laughs> no so i think uh, teaching my children about money is uh, is is three things right so it's it's very important because uh, they obviously end up growing in an um, in an environment very different from the environment we grew in um and obviously all kids are also not the same so my daughter is uh, super conscious of money and uh, very very uh, they, they are both 12 five twins and my uh, sons a little bit more uh, uh, a little bit more liberal for the lack of a better word but uh, overall i think uh, they are fairly conscious uh, both me and shilpa have been kind of uh, fairly uh, fairly exhaustive uh in communicating to them and explaining to them uh the the entire concept of money and the uh and the comforts the pluses and the minuses uh which come along with uh, which come along with money from a money management perspective for the last 4 years i've always been taking them to the office during the uh, diwali days uh to get them a feel of the of the dealing room they love to buy uh, punch a few orders on 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 diwali day and i've got some small model portfolios for them which uh, just allows them to choose between debt and equity and uh, my daughter has always consistently 80 90% debt uh, and 10 20% equity and my son's exactly the reverse is 80 90% equity and uh, 10 20% debt so at, at least just getting them the basic hang of uh, equity debt and how it goes up and down and making them aware of the plus and the minus of money is something which i try and uh, get them to be aware of that's amazing all right so that that brings us to the end of uh, today's podcast thanks a lot mr bhagat uh, for joining us today thank you thank you shiprat that brings us to the end of today's episode if you would like to know more about this topic or make a suggestion of a personal finance topic that you would like us to cover i can be reached at twitter under the username of shipra singh sorot and on linkedin at Shipra Singh thank you for tuning in see you in the next episode this was a mint production brought to you by hd smartcast hd smartcast